Hi everyone, it's Kelly from Breakfast at Kelly's and today we're making sourdough from scratch. So it all started last night when you mixed together your leaven, which is 27 grams of starter and then 135 grams of water and then 135 grams of bread flour. You're gonna let that sit overnight for about 12 hours and then from there you're gonna start making sourdough. So to get started, you're gonna need a large mixing bowl, a scale, a wooden spoon is best if you have a spatula that works as well. I use a tablespoon to remove some of the liquid from the dough and then I just set them on a plate. This is 495 grams of water, 90 grams of milk, salt in a little dish because we're going to be adding liquid to it. This is 270 grams of your leaven that was mixed up the night before. And then we have 900 grams of bread flour. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with pouring our 495 grams of water into this bowl. Um, you should have this between 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. If you don't have a, um, wow, a thermometer, uh, it's just above room temperature. So a little bit warmer than room temperature. And I pre-measured mine, so everything should be accurate. And then we're going to add the 90 grams of milk right to that water. If you're vegan, you could sub out the milk for a dairy-free milk. So I've heard of people using soy milk. You can try coconut or almond milk. I personally have not tried that. Um, also, you can remove the milk altogether. What milk does for your sourdough is it helps to enrich the dough, uh, which creates a little bit of a softer crust. The added sugars from the milk also help with the crust browning. So that is the benefits, but like I said, you don't actually need that. So what we're gonna do now is we are gonna remove 25 grams of liquid out of this bowl and just add it to your salt. Okay, so why we did that. Salt, when you add it directly to your dough, actually slows down the fermentation process. So after our dough autolyzes for about 30 minutes, can be a little bit longer, we're gonna add this back in, we're gonna add the salt back to the dough. If we poured this salt directly on the bread, it would draw the moisture out of the bread and then that's how you would get lots of holes in your bread. So that's how we add the salt with a little bit of moisture so it replaces that moisture that the salt is actually sucking out of the bread. Um, salt obviously adds flavor as well. You do need it for your bread, but we wait a little bit just so it doesn't delay the fermentation and yeah. Okay, so from here, we are gonna add in our 270 grams of leaven that was mixed up the night before. And you can just pour this right in. So leaven is quite sticky. I'm sure you guys, if you've been working with your starter for a while, you have come to realize that. <laughs> and then you can just set that aside. And then you don't have to stir that in. Right after this, you're just adding in your 900 grams of bread flour. Okay, so you're going to be mixing this until there's no dry clumps. Just keep mixing. I find this wooden spoon works really good because it is a little bit bigger, it's a little bit stronger, and actually we don't need the scale anymore because I already measured all the ingredients. And yeah, you're just gonna mix this until there is no dry clumps. And then once it, once it is perfectly mixed, we're just gonna cover it with saran wrap or plastic wrap. If your bowl has a lid, you can just put the lid on there. You do want the dough to get some air, so if you are using saran wrap, make sure you don't seal it completely. You do need it to breathe a little bit. And then I'm gonna put the timing for today on the screen, but you are going to start with your mix time. So that's right now. So say if it was 8 a.m., you're gonna start at 8 a.m. and then you're gonna add your salt 30 minutes later, so at 8.30. And then once your salt's been added, one hour after that, you're gonna do your first set of stretch and folds. And then after that set of stretch and folds, you're gonna wait 90 minutes, so an hour and a half, to do your second set of stretch and folds. And then after that, another 90 minutes, so another hour and a half, and you're gonna do your third set of stretch and folds. And then 40 minutes after that third set of stretch and folds, you're gonna give your dough a par shape, and then 20 minutes later, you're gonna give it a final shape, and then we're gonna let it proof, and then we're gonna stick it in the fridge overnight, and we'll score it tomorrow morning.
Okay, so I think my dough is good and mixed. Why you wanna make sure that there's no dry clumps is those dry clumps will stay in the dough and you'll actually find when you're um, shaping your dough later, you're gonna feel those dry clumps in the dough and you'll be like picking them out and you'll totally be like, oh, why didn't I just mix my dough better at the beginning? So yeah, no dry clumps. And then to get this off, I find it always works best to use wet hands because then the dough doesn't actually stick to your fingers as we know sourdough can be really sticky at first and just peel it off your dough so you're not missing out on anything. And then I should mention as well, this recipe makes two loaves of bread. So two 880 gram loaves of bread, approximately. Obviously it can be a few grams off. Uh, but yeah, that is our mixed dough. Okay, so welcome back everybody. It's time to add the salt to the dough. So you can just remove your saran wrap. And I find at this point, I just like to use my hands. So make sure your hands are nice and clean. If you have any jewelry, remove it. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our salty, milky water and you're just gonna pour that over top. I like to try and spread it out all over the dough. Uh, I find the salt can clump together, so you wanna make sure you really mix it in here. So I'm just gonna pour this on top and then the salt, as you can see, doesn't really love to come out of the bowl. So then just kind of add it in as you can. And then from here, I just kind of rub it in and get it kind of spread out. And instead of mixing it in with a spoon or a spatula, I find I like to combine it as much as I can with my hands, get the liquid kind of incorporated. And then I literally pick up the dough with my hands and I fold it in that way. Uh, like I said, the salt is kind of, if you're trying to mix it in with a spoon, you probably wouldn't be able to. So I just find I get way more coverage. I just kind of keep folding it into each other. I'm just gonna do this until you kind of can see, you'll be able to feel the salt until it's all combined. Okay, that looks good to me. The dough all looks incorporated. So from here, I'm just gonna, sometimes I turn it inside out and then we do a little bit more. I always say I'll be done with something. I'm like, oh, it needs just a little bit more. So. Okay, so that's done. And then from here, you can just cover up your dough again. Like I said, leave a little bit of breathing room. And we'll be back in one hour, and then we'll do our first set of stretch and folds. Okay guys, welcome back. So it has been an hour after we added the salt, and now we're gonna do our first set of stretch and folds. So remove your um, plastic wrap, and then I'll show you this one up close. So for this process, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do before you ever touch your sourdough is make sure your hands are slightly damp. You don't need them soaking wet, but the water does help prevent the dough from sticking to your hands. So just run them under a little bit of water, rub your hands together. And now the goal with these stretch and folds is you're creating gluten in the dough um, and you're strengthening it. So you're gonna to wanna to stretch the dough and then fold it over. And then you're gonna give it a quarter turn, do the same thing. And we're gonna be doing this four times going around the bowl, and then we're gonna let it rest for the 90 minutes before we repeat this process again. Now, your goal here as well is basically to turn your dough inside out. So from here, I like to hold down one side of the dough, and you kind of grab from underneath. I find works the best. And yeah, if you hold down one side, you can see there's not really a lot to the dough yet. There's literally a hole in the middle. <laughs> Give it a quarter turn. Same thing, quarter turn. And then one more time, just on this side. And you'll notice the last one that you do, the dough is gonna feel tighter than the first two. Okay, so that's it. That was our stretch and fold. Now we have 90 minutes before we do this one again. So I will see you guys in 90 minutes. So now we're gonna do the second set of stretch and folds. So same idea as before. And actually, if you take a look at the dough, you can see that it's looking softer, more pillowy than it was before. Anyway, so same thing. We're just going to let our hands dampen our hands. And you're gonna take kind of from the underside of the dough, hold, use your other hand to hold it down and just pull the dough up and then fold it back down. And then give it a quarter turn. You'll see I'll be able to stretch it less and less with each turn that I do. 
Get this one, I'll barely be able to get up. There you go. It's another set of stretch and folds and we are good for another hour and a half or 90 minutes. Okay guys, this is it. Last stretch and fold. And then 40 minutes from now, we, give to, we get to give our dough a par shape. So just unwrap your dough. And then last time, we're gonna make four folds or stretching folds. So again, just reaching from underneath, you're gonna notice the dough probably has a little bit more stretch than it did last time. For a turn. And you're gonna notice too, when you pull it up, you're gonna feel bubbles in it. You're gonna feel the air inside the dough. So it's doing what it's supposed to. Is that four? I think that was four. Yeah, that was definitely four. <laughs> Last one was a little bit too tight. Okay, so I'm gonna cover this up. We're gonna wait 40 minutes and then I'll come back and show you how to prep your battens and we'll go from there. We're almost done for the day. So before our dough is ready, I just wanted to show you guys a few options of what you can proof your loaves in overnight. So the first one is obvious. This is called a banneton. Um, this is the traditional way of proofing your sourdough loaves or artisan bread loaves. Now with these ones, you can either sprinkle them with rice flour and you can actually put the loaf right in there or you can line them with a tea towel. Again, sprinkling the tea towel with rice flour and then fold them up in there. The only difference you're really going to see in that is that if you proof it right into this bowl, you get beautiful grooves in your sourdough loaf as it bakes, which just, it adds to that artisan um, texture of the bread, I guess, or artisan look of the bread. Now these ones range in price. I've seen them on Amazon before for like two for $30, sometimes more expensive. Um, I left out and found this one on my local Facebook marketplace, but I do hope to buy more in the future, but I just want to show you as well that you don't need these to make sourdough. There are other options. So another option, if you have a bowl in the same size, so this bowl here is roughly the exact same, but you would treat it the same. I wouldn't proof the loaf right into this bowl. I would definitely line it with a tea towel and again, sprinkling it with rice flour. And then that way it'll prevent your dough from sticking in the bowl. And then last but not least, lately, um, over Thanksgiving, I ended up doing a lot of sourdough making that week. Just a lot of people were ordering those um, pumpkin loaves. If you look back at my previous YouTube videos, you'll find it. I'll put a link there. But because of that, I didn't want to buy 20 bannetons or 20 bowls. So I went to the dollar store and I actually got these uh, colanders for $1.25 each. And then I just lined them with saran wrap or plastic wrap. And they worked great. And they're roughly the same size as the banneton and this bowl, you can see. And the one thing I was looking for when I was looking for something to put the sourdough into was I wanted to make sure the bottom was round and it didn't just cut off on a sharp end because you do want that rounded loaf shape. So you don't need the fancy expensive banneton. You can definitely use things that you find at the dollar store as well. So don't feel like you need to invest a bunch of money just to make sourdough. Another thing you're going to need are tea towels for lining your bannetons in. These ones I love and I actually picked them up from Ikea and I got them for I think I got four tea towels for like, I don't know, $4 probably, it was Ikea. But these ones are nice because they're just a nice size, they're not too large. Um, I've also used before, Walmart has flour sack towels, but they're just, they're quite big, so you have to fold them over quite a bit, but they work really well as well. And then rice flour, you don't need rice flour, you can use gluten-free flour. I've said this before on my Instagram videos, if you guys don't follow me on there, I'll also put the link for that in the bio. But when you're cooking sourdough, or sorry, when you're making sourdough, if you use the same type of flour to line your banneton that you actually put into the sourdough, your sourdough is going to absorb all that flour and end up sticking to the tea towel in the banneton. Um, instead, if you use a flour that's the opposite, so for example, this rice flour, gluten-free flour, or just something different, your flour or your bread isn't going to absorb that flour, which will prevent it from sticking. So I use rice flour. Um, I've used gluten-free flour before. Those are the two that I've stuck with. I haven't experimented much out of that, but just so you know, that's what you should be lining your bannetons with when you're flouring them. And yeah, now we'll just wait till our dough is done proofing. Welcome back. It is now time to par shape our loaves. So first you're just going to dampen your hands just like before, just so your hands don't stick to the dough. And then this recipe makes two 880 gram loaves. You don't have to weigh this. I do because these loaves, um, 
are for my Thanksgiving orders. So I just want to make sure that they are as close to the same size as possible. I'm just going to take them out and then cut them. And if you are cutting them, you do want to do it quickly just because you don't want to degas your loaves. If it's not the same size, we will figure that out after. Okay, so notice I didn't flour my surface at all. You don't, with sourdough, because it's all fermented flour, you don't want to add a lot of flour to your dough. So preferably, if you can use no flour, that's the best. So again, just as long as you keep your hands damp, you will have no issues here. So we're just gonna stretch out the dough a little bit. Careful, because you really don't wanna degas it. Just stretch it out. And then we're gonna do a series of folding the dough into the center. And lots of people use bench scrapers for this. I personally have never really had to use one. Like it just, for me, it works better without. See, I folded the dough over and created a nice round bowl. Okay, so you can see here, there's even like bubbles on the surface and that's great, you wanna see that. So I'm just gonna create a nice round shape. And kind of my technique here is I like to cut my hands behind the dough and I just drag it along the surface. And then I give it a half turn and I drag it along the surface again. And then just keep repeating that until you're happy with the roundness of the shape. You just wanna make sure with the part shape that all the ends are tucked under. It's just nice and round. Another thing I like to do is if you cup your hands and you just give it a little bit of a turn and then cup your hands, give it a turn. And then just repeating that technique over and over again. So. That one we're just gonna leave, and then I'm gonna do this one. I'll move the camera a little bit closer for this one so you guys can see the technique up close. So what you're gonna be doing here is you're gonna be creating tension in the dough. So my hands are wet because I just dampened them, but you can tell if you look at the dough. I'll see if I can zoom in here for you guys. It kinda has a skin on the top, and because of that, you'll be able to create tension under there and keeping the gas under there. But anyways, you're going to be repeating the same steps that we did before. So again, make sure your hands are slightly damp. You're just going to cup your hands over on the other side and just drag it across the countertop and give it that half turn and do the same thing. And you're going to keep doing this and you're going to notice eventually your dough is going to feel tight and you can see like you're creating bubbles underneath while you're creating that tension. Yeah, and you'll just finally notice like your dough won't move as much anymore. Kind of similar to when you were doing those stretch and folds and you just like, it just wasn't moving. You do want to be gentle here because you don't want to degas it by accident. And then same thing, I kind of do those turns as well where I grab and I just rotate. And you can do this with a bench scraper. I honestly though, I just find my hands have worked well for me. I've never really found the need for a bench scraper. So here it's kind of, it's getting to that point now where it's, quite tight, especially on this one side. I'm just gonna turn it. I think it's to that point now where I really can't move it past this point. And you're gonna notice that when you're shaping your loaves. So all the ends are tucked under. Let's make sure it's all good. And then from here, I've done it before where I've just literally flipped this onto my hand to drop into my banneton bring this back over here or you can use if you have a bench scraper but I just flip it over like that and then I drop it right into my banneton. Uh, at this point you're going to want to top your sourdough with a little bit more rice flour just to prevent the tea towel from sticking. You don't need much and then you can just spread it around. And from here, just fold it up and we're gonna let this proof. While our dough is proofing, I wanna talk a little bit about proofing and what you need to be looking for. So there are a few rules with the sourdough. So if you poke your finger and lightly poke your finger into it and it springs back right away, that means it's under proof. So you still need to go a little bit longer. If you touch your dough lightly and it comes back very slowly, it might even leave a little bit of an indent. That means it's proofed perfectly. And if you poke your finger into it and it doesn't come back at all, that means your dough is overproofed. 
So a few signs that you have overproofed your dome. If you go into the scoring and it, feel, it looks like it deflates, that's usually a good telltale sign that your dough was overproofed. Uh, for me, I love building or creating a really beautiful loaf. Like I love doing a really pretty score pattern, creating a really beautiful loaf that's going to, I don't know, just attract, like I love that. So if that's the case, if you're the same as me, you want to veer on the side of underproofed because if you underproof your dough, you are going to get a little bit better of a score pattern. Uh, so for me, these ones should be done around 5.30 and it's 5 o'clock right now. So if I poke my dough, it very slowly comes back. I'm going to give it a little bit longer just because I know I have about 20 minutes. With this recipe, and keep in mind my house is usually around 22 degrees Celsius and we live in Edmonton, Alberta, which is a drier climate. Um, I usually proof them for about two hours and that seems to be a good amount of time. Depending on your climate and the temperature of your house, you can proof them for up to five hours. So just keep that in mind. It could be different for everyone, but two hours seems to work perfectly for me. So that's usually the amount of time that I proof them for. But anyways, I'm going to give these a little bit longer and then I'm going to stick them in the fridge overnight. And then tomorrow morning, I will take them out first thing and score them and bake them. Okay, so my two hours are up and I just wanted to show you guys what the dough looks like when I consider it to be proofed. And honestly, this is the thing that I struggled with the most out of all things sourdough was when to put my dough in the fridge. And anyway, so I'm just gonna lightly poke it with my finger and you can see it springs back. I'm gonna find a place. Sometimes the drier areas are harder to test. So I try and find a place on it that's a little bit softer. So you can just see it springs back. It springs back slowly, but it still springs back. It's not overproofed. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Breakfast at Kelly's. So we are on day two of our sourdough journey, and I'm just about to preheat my oven. These are both of my Dutch ovens. You don't need to bake it in a Dutch oven. I truthfully have always baked it in a Dutch oven, so I can't tell you much about not baking it in a Dutch oven. Um, but first we're going to do is we're going to preheat our oven to 475 and you're going to place these right inside your oven. One thing with these, you want to make sure that you don't just place them into a hot oven. They're supposed to heat up with the oven. If you just place them right into a hot oven, that's when you risk the enamel cracking. So you can just place them empty right into the oven and we're going to let them preheat for anywhere from 45 minutes to one hour. So the ovens are in the oven. They are preheating at 475 and then I'm just getting everything ready for um, making my sourdough loaf. So for me, this is kind of Thanksgiving week. Last weekend was Thanksgiving, but a lot of people are celebrating this weekend as well. So the loaves that I'm making today are my pumpkin shaped loaves. So I probably will fast forward through the tying of the strings and everything. But if you do want to learn how to make a pumpkin loaf, go check out my other video. I'll make sure I link it for you guys. So what you're going to need though for scoring your loaves, I pre-cut my parchment paper to have wings on it. This way when you drop it into your Dutch oven, you don't have the parchment paper wrinkling up around your dough, which isn't going to affect the shape of your dough. So I just find this works really good. I just cut it the shape. It doesn't have to be perfect. As you can tell, mine is very oblong. Uh, so you're going to need that. You're going to need your sourdough. Uh, have some all-purpose flour on the side or bread flour, whatever works for you. A spray bottle works really well to help adhere the flour to the dough so that way it doesn't flake off once it's finished baking. A brush to remove the excess rice flour that's on the dough right now. Your bread lame or a sharp knife. And then of course for me, I have to use scissors today because I'm making my pumpkin loaves, which is why I have all this string out as well. But let's get started. So when you're scoring your sourdough, well for this pumpkin shape, I have to lay out my string on the top here. And when you open up your sourdough, you're going to notice there's some rice flour that's just kind of dry so that the bottom of the loaf doesn't get too much rice flour on it. I just like to lightly brush that off. So the rice flour, because it doesn't adhere to your dough, it doesn't work very well for keeping the contrast with your dough after you're done baking it because it'll flake off really easy. So I just like to brush it off and that's why I use all purpose flour instead because it'll stick to the dough better or bread flour, whatever you used in your loaf. So this is just baker's twine for anyone that's wondering. If you're wondering why I'm doing this, like I said, make sure you go check out my other videos. I'm making the pumpkin shape. Okay, so if pretend these strings aren't here, you're just gonna take your dough, place your parchment on top, and then you can flip it over. And then just lay it all out nice and flat on your plate. I have a turntable, it's just a, um, a Lazy Susan, and then I just have a plate upside down sitting on it. From here, you can remove your banneton, and then you can also remove your tea towel. 
So you're gonna notice right away, especially on this side, see how there's flakes of this rice flour? You can tell it wasn't absorbed by the loaf as it was proofing. So we're gonna brush that off. We actually don't want that there. And there's a lot, like, and that's totally normal. This just proves that your dough isn't gonna absorb the rice flour. But you definitely do not want that on there because it'll flake off after you're done scoring. And you're just not gonna see your pretty flour, your, your pretty pattern that way. So seriously, every single time I make sourdough, I learn something new. So okay, so at this point, I learned that if you lightly spray it, I should put this knot on. going to lightly spray it just to dampen the loaf and then this will make for a great surface for the all-purpose flour to stick to as you're scoring it. And this is your all-purpose. And then you're just gonna rub that in. You want your dough to be nice and white, but just a, you don't want it to be thick cause it'll cake onto the dough, but you do want there to be a consistent white look to it because that's how you're going to get that beautiful contrast after it's finished baking between your score marks and then the crest of the dough. Okay, so from here, I'm going to just fast forward this so you guys don't have to watch, but I'm just going to start tying my strings. Okay, so now that my strings are out of the way, I can get rid of this excess flour. So I just like to grab a plate and usually brush it onto there. Still is gonna make it a little bit of a mess, but just won't be quite as bad. Okay, so then this here is my bread lame. I use, it's called a UFO lame, and I got this one from Wire Monkey. So if you rotate this, the blade just pops out like that, and then I tighten back up again, and then I'm good to score. Okay, so it's all scored and ready to go. Now I'm gonna do the exact same thing to my other loaf and then we can drop them in the oven at the exact same time. And then you can see they just pick up from your little tabs and then you just drop them right in. Okay, so now it's time to drop the loaves into the oven. So we're gonna use our oven mitts and as soon as we drop the loaves into the oven, we're gonna decrease the temperature to 450 degrees and we'll replace the lids back on top of the ovens as well. So just opening up the oven door. We can just remove these lids quickly and then taking your loaves and you're just going to drop one in at a time. And then from here, replace your lids, seal them up, wow, decrease your temperature to 450 degrees. And then we're gonna let those bake with the lids on for 15 minutes. See you then. So it has been 15 minutes. 
So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna open the door and we're just gonna remove the lids and we're gonna let it bake for an additional eight minutes now. So you can see they have rose a little bit, starting to take shape. And yeah, just close up your oven and we'll leave it at 450 for now and bake it for another eight minutes. Eight minutes is up, so now we're just gonna open the oven and we're just gonna take a quick look at the bread to see what the color is like. If it looks like it's getting quite brown, we'll decrease the temperature to about 430 degrees. But if it looks like it's still quite pale, we'll just leave it at 47, or sorry, 450 and we'll bake it for an additional seven to 10 minutes. Just opening up and you can see it actually is browning a little bit. I'm gonna just rotate this one quickly. Both are rotation. And then I'm gonna bake for an additional eight minutes. So I'm not gonna decrease the temperature, but it's totally up to you if you are or are not going to. It has been seven minutes. We're gonna open the oven door one more time, maybe and just check to see. And the loaves look definitely done, so they are good to come out. Perfect, so they're nice and brown, nice and toasted. So we'll let those cool, and then I'll be removing the strings, and then that is it, that is your sourdough. Okay, so that's it, your sourdough is all done. I cut the strings off these ones and put the cinnamon sticks in for that pumpkin shape, and now they are ready to be delivered to well, whoever gets to enjoy them for Thanksgiving dinner today. So I do want to say if you're unsure if your sourdough is done in the oven, it should be about 205 degrees Fahrenheit internal temperature. So you can check that if you're unsure just by looking at the crust. And then you also should let this cool for about two hours after baking. Uh, I know it's tempting to cut in right away. You can if you really want to, but for best results, I definitely recommend waiting those two hours. Um, they do freeze really well as well. So you can throw these in the freezer after they're finished cooling. So say if I wanted to throw these ones in the freezer, I'd wait till tonight to wrap them up for our, like seal them in a freezer safe bag. But yeah, thank you for joining me on this sourdough tutorial. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, subscribe to my channel, and we'll see you guys next time.